Aloha, and welcome to my talk, Breaking, Entering, and Then Staying. My name is Patrick Wardle. I am a principal security researcher at Jamf, and also the creator of the Mac Security website and tool suite, Objective-C. So today's talk is organized into three main parts, or three main chapters. Chapter one will detail recent attacks targeting Mac users, uh, specifically focusing on attacks that leverage macro-laced documents and discuss methods of analyzing such malicious documents. We'll then also look at a document-based exploit chain that I created that combined what was at the time a few zero-day vulnerabilities to bypass the Sandbox and Apple's latest security mechanisms. Then we will kind of transition to chapter two, right? Now we have the ability to hack Max. The question might become, what could we or what could attackers install to maintain and persist access? So chapter two, we'll talk about an intriguing piece of malware that was recently captured in the wild that is perhaps the first true computer virus targeting macOS systems. And honestly, would make a rather excellent payload for our document-based attacks. Finally, chapter three, we will talk about defense, discussing generic methods for detecting and thwarting both exploits and malware. So let's dive in, uh, starting by looking at how we could hack macOS via macro-laced, macro-laden Office documents. We'll note with some trends, talking about some in the wild attacks. And then as I mentioned, we'll discuss in the exploit chain that was able to infect a fully patched macOS system. So first, what is a macro? Some of you might be familiar with this term, but you know, just to be safe, I've added the official definition from Microsoft on the slide. In short, a macro is embedded executable code in Microsoft Office documents. Uh, in other words, it allows one to add code to a document. So here, for example, I've created a very simple hello world type macro and added it to a Word document. Uh, we can see on the slide when this document is open, if the user agrees to allow macros to execute, a pop-up saying hello world will be displayed. And also because I've added it to the auto open subroutine, which is a Microsoft API that will automatically execute when the document is opened if macros are enabled, this code will be automatically executed as well. Now from a security point of view, allowing executable code to be added into a document has proved to be a, a terrible, a horrible idea, which attackers have abused or taken advantage of for years. In fact, the infamous Melissa virus that targeted Windows-based systems all the way back in 1999 was, yes, you guessed it, a macro virus. Now, Microsoft has added some mitigations such as alerts that documents contain macros and also sandboxing, but we'll see this has not yet fully mitigated the threat. Now, traditionally, macro-based attacks have targeted Microsoft systems, for example, the Melissa virus, due to, I believe, two main reasons. Number one, macros are essentially a Microsoft creation and thus only work in Microsoft uh, products. That is to say, uh, at least on macOS systems, uh, Apple Office applications such as Pages or Numbers don't run macro code. Also, Windows computers, at least in the past, were far more common, far more prevalent, especially in the enterprise. Now, this is definitely changing, especially in the commercial space, the startup space, and even the enterprise. Macs are everywhere. They're becoming far more common, far more prolific. So in short, there are now more Macs running more Microsoft Office products, which means there's more targets that opportunistic hackers are aware and are targeting, trying to take advantage of this. So now let's look at some recent attacks targeting Mac users. All these attacks leveraged macro-laced documents. First, we'll give a high-level overview of each attack, then we'll dive into how to extract and analyze their malicious payloads. Uh, this is a useful skill for you yourselves if you're interested in analyzing malicious Office documents. So, 
We'll start in 2017. Uh, we have a document that appears to be about Trump's unfortunate election victory. The document was opened and the user clicks through the enabled macro prompts, the system would be infected. Moving on to 2018, we have a document that appears to be about Bitcoin, which was a rather trendy hot topic at the time. Again, if the user was tricked into opening the document and allowing the macros to execute, the system would be infected, the system would be owned. Now we'll dig into this specific tack in details shortly, but probably the most interesting aspect about this attack was that it contained embedded exploit code, specifically an embedded sandbox escape designed to break out and escape Microsoft Office's sandbox. On to 2019, we have a document from the prolific Lazarus Group, generally attributed to North Korea. And the most interesting thing about this attack is really seeing that APT groups are jumping on the, hey, let's target Mac OS via macros bandwagon. Again, user opens the document, clicks allow to enable macros, system will be infected. Now, let's discuss methods of analyzing such documents, showing exactly how to extract the embedded mac macros, and then how to analyze both the macro code and their payloads. First, we need to extract the embedded macro code so that we can analyze it and understand exactly what's going on. Now, the details of Microsoft Office documents, the file format, kind of beyond the scope of this talk. But the good news is you actually don't really have to worry about these file format internals because there are several great tools that understand the format for you and are able to extract the embedded macro code for analysis. My favorite one is a tool suite called OLE Tools from GitHub. So you can see on the slide, it's a Python package. Once we've downloaded and install it, if we execute the OLE VBA command, passing in the C parameter and then the path of the document that contains the embedded macros, the open VBA code will parse the document and for any embedded macros that it founds, it will dump them to standard out. This is great. There's also, I should note, various online websites where you can upload a document containing macros to you and the online site or utility will parse that and display the macros for you. So this is good, right? Basically there's automated or programmatic approaches to extracted, extracting the embedded macro code for us. As we now understand how to extract the embedded macro code, let's return to each of the malicious documents we briefly talked about before, looking at their malicious macro code. Understand what the macro code is doing. So let's start back with the document from 2017. Again, using the open v VBA tool, OLE VBA a command, we can extract the embedded documents, sorry, embedded macros from this document. So I've done that and <clears throat> included the embedded macros on the slide. Uh, we can see there's a subroutine in a macro called Fisher, which I've highlighted. Uh, and this is invoked via the auto open method. Uh, we mentioned earlier the auto open method as its name implies, uh, any code that's added in that subroutine will be automatically opened when the document is opened. Uh, if and only if, of course, the user has clicked enable macros when opening the document. So what does this Fisher subroutine do? Well, we can see it concatenating or building a base64 encoded string and then decoding and executing this string via Python. If we manually decode this string, which we can do via Python or any other base64 decoding uh, utility, we can see that unsurprisingly it's Python code. This makes sense because recall this uh, encoded code was passed to Python for execution. So what does this Python code do? Well, it does four main things. Uh, first, it checks to make sure the popular macOS firewall a little snitch is not running. It then downloads a second stage payload from securitychecking.org. It uses RC4 to decrypt this payload and then executes the now decrypted payload. Now, this code might be familiar to you if you do a lot of malware analysis, and that's because it's the well-known open source Python backdoor named Empire. Cool. 
But what about the second stage payload that's downloaded? Well, unfortunately, at the time of analysis, the command and control server that hosted the second stage payload was offline. Uh, however, it's likely Empire's second stage payload, which gives attacker access to the infected system. On to the document from 2018. Let's extract and briefly discuss its embedded macros as well. So again, we can use the OLE VBA tool to extract any embedded macros. You can see I've done that on the slide and the embedded macro code is presented on the slide as well. Uh, again, interestingly, it contains encoded Python. This is just a popular technique used by independent unrelated actors. Also though, it appears to contain an embedded property list, XML plist. So that's interesting. Let's take a closer look at that. So first we're going to decode the Base64 uh, encoded uh, Python. Again, we can use Python's Base64 encoded module or any other Base64 decoding utility. Once we've done that, we get the decoded Python code. I've kind of cleaned this up. You can see it on the bottom of the slide. We can see it's a very basic uh, kind of download and execute Python snippet, right? So what it's gonna do, it's gonna connect out to server and then download and execute a second stage payload. Uh, I was able to capture this second stage payload and it turned out to be Metasploit's Meterpreter, which affords remote access to an infected system. What's interesting is we're kind of seeing this trend of a lot of attackers leveraging these existing open source payloads. I don't know if they're just lazy or trying to be more efficient. Now we mentioned earlier that the most interesting part of this attack was the ability for it to escape the sandbox on older systems. So what is the sandbox? I mentioned it a few times, the recent versions of Mac OS run in what is called a sandbox. And basically what this is, uh, or what it means is that even if malicious code is executed in the context of an office document, for example, macro-based code, it's going to be constrained or constricted by this sandbox, meaning it can't do things like access the user's files or persist a backdoor. Uh, so, you know, from a security point of view, a sandbox is actually a really good thing. However, a security researcher, Adam Chester, found a very neat way to escape the sandbox. Uh, it was kind enough to post a guest blog post about it on my personal Mac security website. Uh, Objective-C. So in short, he noticed that Microsoft Office contained a sandbox exception, which allowed one to create a file anywhere on the file system as long as it started with, with tilde dollar sign. And we can see this, uh, this sandbox ex exception if we look at uh, the sandbox uh, profile for Microsoft Office. Specifically, there's a regex that allows files conforming to tilde dollar sign to be created anywhere on the system. So what Adam was able to do was create something called a launch agent. A uh, launch agent would be automatically executed the next time the user logs in. And since it started automatically by Mac OS, it's gonna run outside the context of the sandbox, giving the malicious code a way to execute uh, far from the constraints of the sandbox, so very nice sandbox escape. We'll see it's patched, but it's important to our exploit chain that we're gonna be talking about later. Finally, let's look at the Lazarus Group document. Uh, if we run the OLE VBA tool, it's going to extract the embedded macro code. Uh, this is actually very easy to analyze because the attackers did not use any obfuscation. So we can see it's very easy to understand exactly what the macro based payload is doing. So it simply downloads and executes a second stage persistent implant. Uh, that implant named mt.dat would give attackers persistent access to the system. Although this document did not contain a sandbox escape, so on modern versions of Office that run within the sandbox, this attack would be somewhat limited. So that was a, an overview of recent macro-based attacks against macOS users which gave us a thorough understanding of the current status quo. Now let's talk though about a more sophisticated, a more elegant macro-based exploit chain. And we might be wondering, why do we wanna do this? Well, besides just the fact that it's something neat, kind of intriguing to do, 
current macro-based attacks are all super lame. Let's list the ways. First, whenever the user opens one of these documents, these macro-based documents, there's gonna be a big alert, a big pop-up saying, hey, user, this document contains macros. You really probably shouldn't allow the macros to run. And luckily, most users will detect something weird is going on and click do not open or open it with macros being disabled, meaning the malicious macro code is actually never even executed. So the attacks are kind of stopped in their tracks right away. Now, if the user does click enable macros, the macro code will be run. But as Microsoft has now patched Adam's sandbox escape, all the attacks remain sandboxed meaning they really can't do much damage, can't persist a backdoor, access users' files, very constricted. Finally, due to Catalina, the most recent version of macOS, uh, due to Catalina's quarantine and notarization requirements, even if something was able to escape the sandbox, when those payloads are executed, they would be blocked by the system. So the reality is the current macro-based attacks targeting macOS users are basically useless. However, I still think we shouldn't underestimate the impact or the potential impact of such attacks. So what I wanted to do was create a full exploit chain that didn't suffer from these limitations, right? It wasn't constrained by the sandbox, uh, would be no alert when the user opened the documents, and will also bypass or get around Catalina's latest code uh, and security requirements. So let's now talk about this exploit chain. So the exploit chain starts with a very neat bug that was found a while ago by two other security researchers and CERT. So this isn't my uh, vulnerability, but we're able to leverage it because at the time it remained unpatched. And what this vulnerability was or what the researchers discovered was that even if macros are turned off, they could create a document that contained macros that would be automatically executed with no alerts no prompts. How? Well, they found that they could abuse a very old file format called SYLK files and write macros not in VBA, but something called XLM. Not XML, but XLM. Now, Microsoft loves to support old file formats for compatibility. So yes, even these file formats from the 1980s still are supported by Microsoft Office, specifically by Microsoft Excel. So the researchers found they could create an XLM macro code that again would automatically be executed if the user had you know, configured their system to never run macros. Kind of ironic. The researchers published uh, some great write-ups on the bug and the older file formats they abused. So if you're interested, definitely check out the link that I've included on the slide. So I wrote a simple proof of concept based on their bug, uh, their code, and we'll see a malicious office document that is downloaded from the internet. And when it's opened, we'll see that calculator is popped. The most important thing to note is there are no macro based alerts, no warnings to the users. As soon as this Excel document is run, it'll execute calculator. That's kind of neat, kind of worrisome. We noted though that Microsoft Office is sandbox, which means sure we can spawn calculator, but that's kind of about it. Uh, we can't persist the backdoor, access users' files, right? That's the whole point of the sandbox, prevent malicious code from doing such things. So in short, we need a new sandbox escape to do any real damage. Because again, as we can see on the slide, we pop the calculator, but it's still running within the sandbox. So I started by looking at Microsoft's patch for Adam's sandbox escape and noticed that they didn't actually address the regular expression that allowed you to create files in arbitrary locations. They simply just constricted it by blocking certain locations such as the launch agent directory. Meaning we can still create arbitrary files as long as they start with tilde dollar sign almost anywhere, right? So again, we can't create one directly in the launch agent directory, but we can in other places on the file system. This is important. Our goal, of course, is to execute something, ideally a binary, outside the sandbox, so we can persist and do evil things. We just noted we can still write specially named files to essentially arbitrary locations, as Microsoft didn't fully patch or address that. 
Turns out, also in the sandbox via macro code, we can download and execute scripts as we can see in a process monitor. Now it's important to note that these scripts will still be sandboxed as they are children of a sandbox parent, but that's a start, right? Being able to execute a Python script just gives you a more verbose way to poke around and perhaps figure out a way to escape the sandbox. So what we can do is via a Python script, which again, we can execute from the sandbox. Uh, this Python script will still be sandbox, but what we can do is we can create something called a logging item. Now, we can't specify any arguments to this login item, but this login item will be automatically executed the next time the user logs in. And since it's started directly by macOS during the login procedure, not via us in the sandbox, it turns out it will not be sandbox. So, hooray, we have a sandbox escape. We're stoked. And we can confirm this by persisting Apple's terminal.app. Again, via Python code that's running in the sandbox that itself is sandboxed. But on next logging, if we go look at activity monitor, we can see that terminal is running and indeed it is running outside the context of the sandbox. However, we then very quickly run into Catalina's more stringent quarantine and new notarization. We can see if we persist an arbitrary binary, for example, a backdoor as a login item, when macOS goes to launch it outside the sandbox, it will be blocked. The system basically detects that it's from the internet or from a document that was loaded from the internet. And since it has a quarantine flag set and is not notarized, meaning it's not been approved by Apple, which is what notarization does, the system won't block that. So we can see that in the bottom of the slide We've escaped the sandbox, but unfortunately, our malicious login item is blocked. Bummer. But hope is not lost. If, and this is a big if, if we can create a launch agent, we can specify our own arguments and persist a non-interactive, non-sandboxed uh, rather, reverse shell via bash. Let's break this down. Uh, first, Specifying arguments is important. We cannot specify arguments via a login item, but we can via a launch agent. That's cool. Uh, since we can specify arguments in a launch agent, we can create a bash shell that will connect to an IP address of our, uh, of our chosen. And since this uh, interactive non-sandbox reverse shell is running outside the context of the sandbox, we can download and run additional binaries. These additional binaries will not be constricted by Catalina's new quarantine and notarization requirements uh, because we can remove the quarantine attribute. So this would be great, right? This is the goal, but recall Microsoft's patch specifically prevents the creation of launch agents from within the sandbox. This is how they fix or address Adam's sandbox escape. So we have all the potential pieces, but we just can't put them together, right? We can escape the sandbox via a login item, but login items cannot take arguments. And also they can't be third party or random binaries due to notarization requirements. In other words, we can only persist Apple items, again, with no arguments. And sure, we can bypass notarization if we can create a launch agent, but we can't create a launch agent from the sandbox due to Microsoft's partial patch. So in other words, we have to find a way for the system, or rather an Apple binary, with no arguments to create a launch agent for us. And if we can, we'll be stoked because then we can you know, bypass all things. So I had a random idea. What happens if you create a login item that is not a binary, not an application? Like if you persist a zip file, how does the system handle that? Well, it turns out on logging, the file's default handler will be automatically invoked, which means for a zip file, macOS will automatically invoke Apple's archive utility to unzip that file. Now, remember we want to create a launch agent because a launch agent runs outside the sandbox, allows us to specify arguments, and will allow us to create this interactive reverse shell that can download and execute uh, non-notarized binaries. However, due to Office's custom sandbox rule, we cannot write directly to the user's launch agent directory. 
But if that directory does not exist, which on a default install of Mac OS, it does not, we can create a zip file one directory up in the user's library directory. This is allowed. We can do this from the sandbox. And what do we put in this zip file? Well, a directory called launch agents, and within that, a launch agent property list. Great. So if we persist this, the next time the user logs in, the zip file will be automatically extracted by Apple's archive utility running outside the sandbox because login items run outside the sandbox. It will create the launch agent directory with our launch agent in it, allowing us to create this interactive reverse shell. So this is our exploit chain. Let's briefly just reiterate and walk through each, each of the, the pieces to show how it works in, in, a, in whole. So again, the user opens this SYLK file that contains these old school XLM macros. This will be uh, launched in Excel, automatically executing the macros, no alerts, no prompts. What this does is this then will download and persist a specially crafted zip file as a login item. On the next login, macOS will analyze the registered or installed login items, see one that points to a zip file, and will then invoke the archive utility automatically outside the sandbox to process this zip file, which, as we just mentioned, creates uh, the launch agent directory with our launch agent property list. On next logging, macOS sees that a new launch agent has been created, runs it, and because of our arguments and what we've specified, it executes a bash-based interactive backdoor. This is going to be allowed because bash, again, is an Apple binary, not constrained to notarization requirements. Just mentioned that this bash backdoor is executing outside the context of the sandbox and can download and unquarantine files. This is a really important point because since it can unquarantine files, Apple will not check the notarization status of these files. So this means we can, for example, download and persist uh, Mac malware. And that's exactly what I did. I took a well-known Mac backdoor known as Windtail. Uh, and you can see in the Slack logs, I was pretty stoked when this all worked. Uh, user clicks the document, end result. We have a persistent Mac uh, backdoor installed on the system. Hooray. Okay, so now we have the ability to hack Macs that we could, or an attacker could, uh, you know, utilize to target perhaps Macs in the enterprise. So the question becomes, okay, what do we persist? And yeah, we could use something like Wintail, but that's known and that's not really that sophisticated. Uh, so what about some brand new Mac malware? So we're now gonna talk about some new Mac malware. Uh, it's rather intriguing, has some really neat capabilities. Uh, and this malware has been dubbed uh, Evil Quest. Although we'll see the malware author refers to it as effective idiot. So we're gonna describe how to analyze the code of this malware to discuss its capabilities and show how it's perhaps the first true computer virus targeting Mac OS. Uh, and with this knowledge, with this understanding, we could very easily package up this malware into our document-based exploit chain and hack Macs across the world. First, I wanna give some Credits, a shout out to Dinesh for uncovering the malware in the wild, uh, as his tweet really intrigued me and, uh, you know, gave me the motivation to dig more into the Evil Quest malware, which we are now talking about. Now, before we dive into its persistence and its capabilities, let's perform an initial triage to discuss how to decrypt its strings and thwart its anti-analysis logic. Because again, we want to be able to comprehensively analyze this malware to understand the threat it poses, but also perhaps to repurpose it for our own purposes. So this malware uh, distributed via a disk image, a DMG. Uh, if we attach or mount the DMG, which we can do via the HDI util command, we can see it contains a single package named mixed in key8.pkg. My favorite tool for analyzing packages is aptly named suspicious package. Uh, via this for utility, we can statically analyze the package's contents. For example, extracting embedded files, looking at scripts it's gonna run, et cetera, et cetera. 
we can see there is a pristine application called Mixed In Key 8. I say it's pristine because it's still signed by the original uh, Mixed In Key developers. So we can assume that this is not infected, knock them out. However, there is a second binary that's unsigned that's called patch. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's take a closer look. Before we do that though, we want to note that the package also contains something called a post install script. So during the installation, the installer will ask the user for their credentials. And once a variety of files have been moved into place, once the installer has completed, it executes something called a post install script. Uh, I've included the post install and script on the slide, and we can see the script moves that patch binary into a directory called mixed in key and renames that binary to tool room D and then launches that. So let's take a look at this patch binary or the renamed tool room D binary, right? They're the same thing. Binary malware is just made a copy of them. Now, one of the first things I do when analyzing a unknown, potentially malicious Mako binary is to run the strings command. And this allows us to extract any embedded ASCII strings, which a lot of times provides interesting information about the malware's potential capabilities. We see if we run the strings command on the patch binary, a lot of interesting things kind of fall out. We can see things that look like encrypted strings. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, things that perhaps are command line arguments. Uh, some strings that appear to relate to network or command control communications. Uh, perhaps something that relates to key logging, file encryption, and then also a path which, if we swap, reveals the malware author's name for the malware, something called Effective Idiot, or EI for short. We can also run the NN utility. It's a built-in utility into Mac OS, and that will extract embedded symbols and APIs that the malware imports. The APIs, again, reveal the malware's likely capabilities, even more insightful, though, are the actual names of the malware functions or methods. So we can see based on those likely capabilities. So we can see there's key logging APIs. We can see it looks like the malware perhaps supports remote commands, file encryptions, perhaps some, has some anti-analysis logic, and based on the function names, likely persists. Now I mentioned when I ran the strings command, there was a large variety of what appeared to be encrypted strings. This is fairly common. Malware authors know malware analysts, such as myself, will look for embedded strings. Obviously, they want to make our analysis more difficult, so they encrypt sensitive strings. So if you come across encrypted strings, it's really good to decrypt them because normally they have very interesting or sensitive pieces of information that the malware author is trying to hide. So if we hop into a disassembler, we can see that these encrypted strings are passed to a method named EI underscore stir. Again, EI is short for effective idiot, which is the malware author's name for this creation. I was kind of lazy. So instead of trying to manually understand how the string decryption routine worked, I decided to basically just get the malware to decrypt the strings for me. So what I did was I created an injectable dynamic library that would load itself into the malware's address space while the malware was running, obviously in a virtual machine. And then it would resolve the address of the string decryption function, EI underscore stir, and then would simply directly invoke it on all the encrypted strings. This turns out to be a very effective approach to decrypt all of the malware's encrypted strings which as we can see on the slides are pretty revealing. We can see URLs, IP addresses, a launch agent property list, a list of security applications, and perhaps even some ransom instructions. Very interesting, right? Gives us a lot of insight into the likely capabilities of this malware. Finally, during this initial triage stage, we encounter various anti-analysis logic. Again, this is fairly common in malware because Malware wants to prevent itself from being analyzed, from having its secrets being revealed. So for example, we see a method, a function named isVirtualMachine that attempts to detect if the malware is running in a sandbox. We also see a function named isDebugging, another one called PreventTrace, which seek to prevent the successful debugging of the malware. Good news, at least for us, not for the malware, is that it's very easy to bypass all of these methods. 
we can basically simply set a breakpoint on them in a debugger. And then when they are about to be executed, we can change the instruction pointer to effectively skip over them, meaning they're never executed. So the anti-analysis logic is never actually run. All right, so we've bypassed the anti-analysis and decrypted all the encrypted strings. Now we can perform a full analysis of the evil quest bower, starting with analyzing its persistence mechanism. And again, our goal here is really to comprehensively understand uh, the malware for a variety of reasons, but the main one being the ability to package up with our office-based attack. So there is a function named EI persistence main, which I thought, hmm, this probably has or is related to how the malware persists. So let's begin our analysis there. If we open the malware in a dissembler or decompiler and start looking at code at the EI persistence main function, we can see the first thing it does is execute some anti-analysis logic, which as we mentioned, we can simply st step over or skip in a debugger to ensure that it's not executed. We can also see it enumerating all running processes looking for popular security tools, any that it, fi it finds it attempts to kill. And recall that list of those security tools was, uh, are hard-coded embedded in the malware. And then it invokes a method named persist executable. Uh, if we run a file monitor and allow this function to execute, we can observe the malware making a copy of itself as a binary named com.apple.questd. Malware then evokes a function called install daemon to persist itself both as a launch agent and as a launch daemon. So twice, I guess the more the merrier. Recall that the property list for these launch items was stalled, installed, uh, was rather stored, encrypted within the malware. So if we let this function execute uh, and then go look at the file system, we can see that the malware has decrypted this property list and written it out to disk. So then we can go and check and see the values of it that have been stored uh, on disk. Uh, we can see that it points to the com.apple.questd binary that the malware made, copy of itself. More importantly, the run at load key is set to true. Uh, this tells the operating system to automatically restart the launch agent or launch daemon every time the system is rebooted and the user logs in. Uh, finally, then the malware launches the launch items via Apple Script. So now we understand how the malware persists. Let's tie, it's now time to talk about its capabilities, its goals. What does the malware actually do? First though, let's discuss how it connects to its command and control server to check in and receive tasking. So what the malware does is it decrypts a hard-coded address of a URL hosted on pythonanywhere.com. It then connects out to this URL, attempting to read a file named ret.txt, which contains the address of the command and control server, which it then connects out to. It's important to note that if either of these URLs is offline, the malware also contains a hard-coded address of a backup command and control server. So one of the first actions the malware takes when it runs after it persists and kind of set itself up is to generate and exfiltrate a recursive directory listing of the infected system. Uh, we can watch this in a debugger, as we can see on the slide, uh, noting that the root of the directory listing is slash users. So again, the malware will enumerate the user's directories, send that up to the attacker, to the command and control server. Malware also searches for various files that match a list of regular expressions, which we can see on the slide. These regular expressions are embedded in the malware. Uh, from these regular expressions, we can see that the malware has a, a propensity for certificates, cryptocurrency keys, and wallets. Any file on the infected system that matches any of these regular expressions will be exfiltrated to the attacker. We can test this by creating a file named something like key.png and watch, for example, in a debugger as the malware detects this file, scoops it up, and exfiltrates it up. So unfortunately, if a system has been infected with uh, evil quest, effective idiot, 
kind of safe to assume that the attacker has all your, has a lot of your you know keying material, certificates, and information such as that. Kind of a bummer. Malware also supports a handful of commands that afford a remote attacker complete and continuing control over the system. On the slide, we can see the functions that implement this logic, including the serialization of an HTTP request sent to the command control server, and then the deserialization of the response that contains any commands. A function named dispatch will dispatch the commands received from the command and control server. And we can see on the slide, I've created a table of the supported commands. Nothing super surprising here. See things like download, execute, kicking off a keylogger. Pretty standard commands that backdoors implement. However, I briefly want to talk about command number one as it's probably the most interesting. So if the malware receives command number one from the command and control server, it executes a function named ei underscore run memory underscore hrd, which turns out to execute an encrypted payload downloaded directly from the command and control server, directly from memory. Now I talked about this technique at Black Hat a while back, but clearly it, the benefit is the, the decrypted payloads never hit the disk. They're decrypted and then executed directly from memory, meaning that they can't be scanned by file-based antivirus, antivirus engines, nor grabbed for forensics analysis. So this is a very stealth, stealthy technique that the malware supports. Malware also supports ransomware logic. Logic, pretty standard, at least in the context of, of ransomware. So what it does is enumerates all the files on the file system. And for ones that list a or match a hard-coded list of file extensions, such as images and documents, it will encrypt the files. Specifically, it reads in each of these files into memory, encrypts that content, writes out the encrypted content to a temporary file, deletes the original file, and then renames the temporary file to the name of the original file. End result, user's files are encrypted. Yeah, pretty standard ransomware, right? Once the files have been encrypted, the malware creates both a readme text file and displays an alert that is also read, outside, uh, read out loud, containing instructions. Interestingly, though, there's no contact email address. Strange. Good news is, researchers at Sentinel-1 figured out that the keying material stored in each encrypted file is actually enough to decrypt the file, so no need to pay. Cool. Now, saving the best till the last, turns out that EvilQuest, or Effective Idiot, is actually a true computer virus, which is perhaps the first in the wild computer virus targeting macOS. The majority of malware targeting macOS is by definition not truly computer virus. So what is a computer virus? Well, I've included the definition on the slide. Basically, it is a program that when executed replicates itself by modifying other computer programs and inserting its own code. Most Mac malware does not do this. It just installs itself and that's about it. It doesn't modify or tamper other binaries on the file system. So what EvilQuest does is invokes a method called get targets, which gets a list of executable files on the infected system. And then for each of these target or candidate binaries, it invokes a function named append EI. EI obviously standing for effective idiot. As its name implies, what it'll do is it'll append itself into the start of each of these executables. More specifically, it inserts itself into the beginning and then also adds a trailer that contains the offset to the original code. It also then adds an infection marker so it doesn't infect the same binary twice. Now, when that executable is run, either via the user or automatically by the system, if it's some binary that the system has persisted, the viral code will obviously be executed first. Now, to assure, ensure nothing appears amiss, the virus then writes out the original code to a temporary directory and then executes it. This isn't the most stealthy, right? If we're running a process monitor like I have on the slide, we can see that the uh, infected binary as I mentioned, spawns this uh, original binary once it's written out. 
but this does have the benefit of restoring the code signing signature of the original file, which must be an intact if the original binary contains code signing entitlements. Interestingly, the malware continues to evolve. Trend Micro recently published a great report on the updates to EvilQuest, including the fact that it contains improved anti-analysis logic, the addition of new capabilities, and the removal of the ransomware logic, which is interesting. However, I think the coolest update was in the ping command, which now contains the string, hello Patrick. Apparently the malware authors read some of my initial analysis work. Honestly, I've always wanted a shout out in a computer virus. Is that wrong? <laughs> so we've talked about hacking Max and also a new virus that could be easily installed as the payload for this hack via our exploit chain. Let's end though by talking about defending against these attacks with some generic methods of detection. First, for the vulnerabilities I found in my exploit chain, I responsibly reported these bugs both to Microsoft and Apple. Microsoft basically said, this is a known issue on the Apple side, which is surprising. I mean, not wrong. I told Apple as well. Apple said, thank you. And then I heard nothing. Uh, I kind of circled back many months later and they said, oh yeah, we you know, fixed this in 1015.3. I said, cool. Was there security alerts, CVE? No, nothing. Classic Apple. Frustrating. So, good news though, vulnerabilities have essentially been patched, uh, but how do we defend against these attacks or, or malware, right? Um, and the answer is by monitoring and detecting anomalous system activity. And if we do this programmatically, using Apple's new endpoint security framework is a must. Apple states, it's an API for monitoring system events to detect malicious activities. I've also written some tutorials on the topic as well. So let's look at some examples of how we can use Apple's new endpoint security framework to detect our exploit chain or some of the activities of the malware we talked about today. So first up, it's very easy to create a process monitor using Apple's new endpoint security framework. And via this process monitor, we can detect suspicious children. What is a suspicious child? It's something that is rather anomalous. For example, Microsoft Word spawning curl or Python, right? That's suspicious. So as we can see on the slide, we can now detect when Office or Excel specifically spawns child processes that are, well, as I mentioned, suspicious. So regardless of the reason, regardless of the exploit, how it occurred, if you see Excel spawning curl or Python, that's bad news. That's, that's not a good sign, right? Something is amiss. Like maybe Patrick trying to hack your Mac. <laughs> we can also detect a wide range of attacks, including the exploit chain we described by monitoring the file system for persistent events. Again, using Apple's new endpoint security framework, we can create a monitor, specifically a file monitor, and look for activities or events related to persistence. So using this file monitor, for example, we can detect a new login item that is not an application, but a zip file. That's really anomalous, very suspicious, and likely indicative of our sandbox escape. Now on to detecting the actual malware we talked about, either the specific one we talked about or any other malware as well. Really, it's not that hard to detect if we focus on behavior-based detection. First, it's pretty easy to detect the malware based on its persistence. Uh, it's persisting an unsigned launch item masquerading as an Apple binary. This is very shady because Apple signs all their binaries by Apple. So if you see an unsigned launch item being persisted that claims to be something uh, related to Apple or an Apple binary, but it's not signed, huge red flag, likely malware. We can also detect the malware's ransomware logic by detecting the rapid creation of encrypted files by an untrusted process. Again, this is something that doesn't normally happen on the system. So we can fairly easily detect this and figure out something is amiss. Finally, if we are monitoring network traffic, for example, via firewall, we can detect the malware's unauthorized network communications. All right, so let's wrap this all up. So, 
Today we illustrated that attackers are now more than ever targeting macOS users. And this is largely because Mac systems are just becoming more common, especially in the enterprise. Very common attack vector is to use malicious office documents, documents laden with macro-based uh, macros. Uh, this is largely because, as I mentioned, Macs in the enterprise are more popular, and also attackers have had great success targeting Windows computers using these same attacks, so they figured, why not simply port them to target Mac users? So, the trend we're definitely seeing. And while the attacker-based attacks, the ones in the wild, are pretty lame, right? They're constricted by the sandbox, the user has to click enable macro. We showed a pretty sophisticated, rather elegant macro chain that showed or illustrated that things unfortunately could be a lot worse if attackers put in a little more time and effort. Attackers are also improving their malware. Today we talked about a new computer virus named EvilQuest, rather sophisticated, targeting macOS systems. However, we ended by showing that by leveraging Apple's new endpoint security framework, one can generically detect these and other attacks. So that's great news. Now, one more thing. Uh, since we're here talking about Mac malware and exploits, I want to briefly discuss my new book on this exact topic. Uh, this is a free online book dedicated to all things about Mac malware and exploits. So if you're interested in these topics, pop over to taomm.org to check it out. I want to end by thanking you all for virtually attending my talk. Hope you're all well, staying safe. I also want to thank Jamf, my main employer, for, well, let's say putting up with my shenanigans. And then also all the amazing companies that support Objective-C. So once again, thank you for attending my talk. Hope to see you all in person in 2021. Aloha.